Well, welcome again to Dwell Community Church as we study through the person of Jesus. And really the most important question that we could ever ask ourselves, which is, who is Jesus of Nazareth? You know, Jesus asked his own disciples, who do you say that I am? And for the next 2000 years, many people have been asking precisely the same question, trying to answer Jesus's own question. In fact, we can't seem to get away from Jesus. He's on the cover of all of our magazines, our movies, our journal articles. He seems to be throughout the news and so forth. But really, we need to answer, who was this Palestinian preacher? Many people have sought to identify Jesus. Some say that he's the Messiah. Others would say that he's a myth. Others still would say that he was just a good moral teacher. And others would say that he was a menace or perhaps even mentally ill. Well, let's look at each one of these here together, evaluating and assessing the evidence for the historical Jesus. Let's start with that first one, myth. Was Jesus a myth? Well, let's look at the four biographies of Jesus that are found in our New Testament, but which were really just documents which were handed down out of the first century to us today even according to critics of the Bible. So not Christian scholars, but critics, they would agree that these documents, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written in the first century AD. And so these have a very early date to Jesus's life. So too, when we see the transmission of these documents to our present day, we see that these were accurately transmitted. Now to understand this, we don't have any original copies of the New Testament. But then again, we don't have any copies of any document from antiquity. And so we have to ask the question, how do we really know what they wrote, those original authors? Here we turn to the science of what's called textual criticism. This is where we compare the different ancient documents and see uh, how they compare and stack up to the New Testament. So we look at the ancient work, and then we look at its earliest manuscript, and then we look at the total number of manuscripts. So for example, Tacitus, one of the great historians of the early second century, he wrote in AD 110, and yet the earliest manuscript for Tacitus doesn't come for 700 years in AD 850 to AD 1050. How many manuscripts do we have of Tacitus who tells us so much about the ancient Roman world? Well, we only have 36. And so on it goes. Herodotus, the father of his history, Thucydides, the prince of history, Sophocles, Plato, Caesar, all the way down to Homer's Iliad. Now this is the leader of the pack. Homer's Iliad was written in 800 BC and our earliest manuscript for Homer is dated to 415 BC. And we have 1900 manuscripts of Homer's Iliad. So this is wonderful for a textual critic because they can take the 1900 texts and compare them with each other. They can see which one's older, they can see which one's younger, and they can see the different textual divergences between the different family of texts. Well, how does all of this compare to the New Testament documents? Unlike all the other documents from antiquity, the New Testament has its earliest manuscript in the P52 document. It's called the John Rylands Fragment, which dates to 30 years after John wrote his gospel. So instead of waiting hundreds of years before we get our first manuscript, we actually only have a few decades. And how many manuscripts do we have of the New Testament? Surprisingly, we have 5,856 manuscripts. Now, each one of these manuscripts is, on average, 400 pages. And if you were to add all these together, it would reach about 2.5 million pages of text. Just to put this in perspective, our earliest manuscript for the New Testament dates to just after the close of the first century. By the time we get to AD 200, just within 100 years, we have most, the majority of the New Testament. 
And by the time we get to 350 BC, or excuse me, 350 AD, we have full Bibles, both Old and New Testament in Greek, and we have the full New Testament in Codex Sinaiticus and half of the Old Testament in Greek. So we're sitting on actual gold when it comes to the New Testament. If we were to doubt the New Testament documents because we didn't think that we could know what they actually wrote, we would have to doubt everything from historical antiquity or ancient times. This is why Dan Wallace, who is an eminent New Testament textual critic, wrote this, less than 1% of all textual variants affect the meaning of that verse, though none affects core doctrine. So there are 138,000 words in the New Testament, the Greek New Testament. And of those 138,000, 1,400 are in dispute. So 1% are in dispute. And even this 1% does not affect any core doctrine about the faith of Christianity. Now you might say, well, how do we know which verse is which? How do we know which text in the New Testament is actually reliable? Well, this is very easy. You don't need to be a Greek scholar or a textual critic to know this. We read from Mark chapter 9, which verses are thought not to be in the original? Well, they're in brackets. I'm sure you can see this right here. These are bracketed off in modern Bibles. And what is so uh, distorted? Was it a, a nefarious, uh, evil scribe who was trying to add something into the New Testament? Far from it. Instead, we see that he probably pulled this line from verse 48. This is a case of what's called dittography. Like if I said, I love you, and you said, ditto. Dittography means that um, you're writing something again, writing something twice. And so we have nothing to fear when it comes to the transmission of the New, New Testament documents. In fact, according to Daniel Wallace, he says that 70% of all of these textual variants are due to spelling errors. So this only shows that the ancient scribes could spell as well as we can here today. Well, even critic Bart Ehrman, who has devoted his adult life to textual criticism and seeing how well the New Testament stacks up and how well it was transmitted to us today, even he, who is, who is an ardent critic of Christianity, says this on page 162 of his book, Misquoting Jesus. He writes, this oldest form of the text is no doubt closely, very closely related to what the original author wrote. So even he, though he points out all of the different variants, even he would say we have substantively, substantially what the original authors wrote. Why should we trust the New Testament documents? One of the reasons is that they record historical details with incredible accuracy. So for example, in 2002, we found James, the half-brother of Jesus's ossuary. Now you might say, what's an ossuary? An ossuary is basically a bone box. When people would decay, they would collect their bones and put them into a tiny little coffin. And we found this ossuary in 2002, which says Jacob or James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus, Yeshua. We also found Caiaphas's ossuary. Caiaphas was the high priest during the time of Jesus. We have his coffin. Critics used to say that they were unconvinced that Pilate existed, Pontius Pilate, the governor over Judea. Even though we have historical documents outside the New Testament, they still weren't sure until the 1970s when they found the Pilate stone, where he's mentioned specifically. And then the New Testament goes into really striking detail, I mean, throwaway comments, things which aren't needed to support the flow of the narrative. For example, uh, Jesus heals a man who was born blind by the pool of Siloam. In John chapter 5, he heals a man who is physically handicapped by the pool of Bethesda, which was said to have five pillars or porticos. Now, for years, critics of the Bible said this must be some imagination of, of some author from outside of Jerusalem because we've never found the Pool of Siloam or the Pool of Bethesda until they uncovered the Pool of Bethesda. 
And as we read, uh, as we read rather, in John chapter 5, the pool has five porticos. When they uncovered and unearthed this pool, they didn't find two porticos, or three, or four, or six, seven, eight, nine, or ten. They found five porticos in the pool of Bethesda, which was covered over after the Romans took over in AD 70. So it's baffling to me that people could think that the New Testament authors would be correct when it comes to the details, but they would be incorrect when it comes to the overall flow of the historical narrative. We see too that the authors of these four biographies were incredibly honest, in fact, embarrassingly honest. This passes what historians refer to as the criterion of embarrassment that if you write something which is embarrassing, it, it shows your authenticity as an author. For example, the New Testament authors record embarrassing details about themselves. Look at this. They call themselves unintelligent, uneducated, uncaring, cowardly, and doubtful. I love in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus affirms Peter when Peter calls him the Messiah, and yet just a few verses later, Peter says something wrong and Jesus turns around and calls him Satan. This occurs in Mark as well, Mark chapter nine. And Mark was overseen by none other than the apostle Peter. So Peter, the one who helped to write the gospel of Mark, actually includes this narrative about himself. This shows the honesty of these authors. They also recorded embarrassing accusations about Jesus. His, his opponents called Jesus deranged, deceitful, drunk, and even demon-possessed. Now, if you were starting a new worldview and a, a faith system, why would you include these, these horrific accusations against your main leader? So to the New Testament authors and specifically the biographers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't put words in Jesus' mouth. So for example, later in church history, we see a tremendous argument over circumcision. You know, should Gentiles who never were circumcised, should they have to be circumcised now that they've become Christians? Or what about our relationship to the law? Do we need to follow the ceremonial law or the civil law or even the moral law in the Bible? And so too, uh, speaking in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, different behavior that's happening in the Christian community. Most of all, the Jewish-Gentile controversy. The Jews and the Gentiles were at just complete animosity and antipathy toward one another. They hated each other for centuries. But now, both Jewish people and Gentile people had become Christians and they were trying to get along with one another. So intense hostility and, and racism. And now they were becoming brothers and sisters in Christ. All of these different controversies were occurring in the early church. How many of these did Jesus speak to? Not one. He didn't speak to a single one, which shows to us that these disciples didn't feel comfortable putting words into Jesus' mouth. They didn't feel comfortable solving all of the problems of the early church by writing those back into the Gospels. So for example, we can read in uh, 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul is referring to divorce. And as he refers to divorce, he says that I have a word from the Lord about this. And so he appeals to Matthew 19 or Mark 10. But then he goes on to say, well, regarding people who are single, well, I don't have a word from the Lord about this. I don't have anything from the Gospels or I don't have anything that was passed on to me from Jesus. And so Paul very deliberately was showing that one thing he did get from Jesus and another he had to write on his own spiritual authority. So too, we see that the New Testament story in its core basic form is corroborated even by hostile critics of Christianity. Let me name just a few. Suetonius, Josephus, Tacitus, the Babylonian Talmud, Pliny the Younger, and Lucian of Samosata. Let me give you just a little bit here. Tacitus, the Roman historian says, in his Annals, book 15, he says, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius, who died in AD 37, 
at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus, who left his reign in AD 36. So to Josephus, he writes, many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. Now there's a part of Josephus in this section which is interpolated. It was an addition that was placed in later by presumably Christians. The part I'm reading to you here is held by the majority of Josephan scholars. They believe that this part is what goes back directly to Josephus himself. And he affirms that people became followers of Jesus and that he was condemned by Pontius Pilate and was crucified. The Babylonian Talmud, which was basically codified or brought together from the, the Mishnah and the commentaries on the Mishnah from earlier in the third and fourth and fifth centuries AD, they write this, on the eve of Passover, so right before Passover, Yeshu, Yeshua, was hanged. Of course, they don't mean a, a knot and a noose, they mean hanged in the sense of Galatians 3.15 or 3.13 rather, that Jesus was hanged from a cross. Then finally, Lucian of Samosata, in his work, The Death of Peregrinus, he writes that the Christians you know worship a man to this day who was crucified. So they worshiped Jesus, they met together to sing, and he says that these people worshiped a crucified Messiah. This is why the emeritus professor at the University of Nottingham, Dr. Maurice Casey, who himself left the Christian faith six decades ago and calls himself, quote, completely irreligious, has this to say. He says the whole idea that Jesus of Nazareth did not exist as a historical figure is verifiably false. It has not been produced by anyone or anything with any reasonable relationship to critical scholarship. So to believe that Jesus was a myth or that he never existed or that we can't know who Jesus was seems to be unreasonable at best. Well, what about that second option that Jesus was a moral teacher? There's a main problem with this. It's that Jesus claimed to be God. We read this, for example, in the old uh, Hebrew uh, Bible, the, the Hebrew Bible which looks forward to the time of Jesus. These predictions, such as Isaiah 9, verse 6, says that a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. So this will be an infant who is born naturally. He will be a child who has a physical birth, and he will be called a son to us, yet... His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So how could a little baby, a little child who's born be called Mighty God? Unless you believe that this is predictive of Jesus being both human and God. In fact, all of these terms are used by Isaiah himself in his own book to describe Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, what's called the, the holy name for God, what's called the, the tetragrammaton, tetra meaning four and grammaton meaning grammar, four letter name for God. He uses all of these different modifiers to describe Yahweh himself. So too, Jesus makes indirect claims. So not directly saying, I'm God, I'm God, walking around ancient Judea, but he makes many indirect claims. For example, Jesus said that we should worship God alone. Matthew 4, verse 10. Now, of course, as a very good Jewish rabbi in the first century, Jesus was quoting from Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments. We should only worship God alone. And yet, throughout the rest of the book of Matthew, we read that Jesus accepted worship. Now, we see in other examples Acts chapter 14, when, when people tried to worship Paul, for example, he ripped his clothes. He thought that was pure idolatry. Uh, when people tried to worship Peter in Acts chapter 10, Peter pulled the guy up, Cornelius, by the scruff of the neck and said, don't worship me, worship God. Even in the book of Revelation, when an angel speaks to John and John falls down to worship him, again, he picks him up and says, worship God alone. So what is this communicating? Namely, that Jesus was claiming to be deity or divine. 
Jesus spoke in God's place. In something like 500 different times in the Hebrew Bible, we see that the prophets would repeatedly say the expression, thus says the Lord, thus says the God of Israel, thus says the Lord of hosts. This happens 500 times. Jesus never says this. Instead, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. He speaks for God in the first person speaking directly, and even says to have authority over things like the Sabbath and the Old Testament ceremonial laws given in Mark chapter seven. Jesus also called himself the Son of Man. Now many people believe that the Son of Man refers to Jesus's humanity, not to his deity. That the Son of Man means that you're just a son of man, a son of a human being. Far from it, we couldn't be more misled this comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. There we read, There before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. So Daniel gets a vision of one like a son of man, seeing God, the Ancient of Days, in the clouds. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power, and all over all peoples, nations, and men, and of every language, these people worshiped him. Now, if you know the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter two, Daniel refuses to worship the idols in Babylon. Daniel's uh, later, his friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to worship at, at Nebuchadnezzar's big idol. Later in Daniel six, Daniel would rather be fed to the lion's den than to not pray to the God of Israel. What do we see here? Daniel in chapter seven, on the heels of all that, says that there will be one like a son of man, distinct from God, the ancient of days, and he will be given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Only God has sovereignty, and everyone on earth will worship him. Now, some people have objected that maybe this doesn't refer to the son of man in Daniel. Not so fast. We read in Mark 14, uh, verse 61, the high priest asked Jesus at his trial, he said, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus replied, ego emi, I am. The Greek expression ego emi is the translation of the Old Testament word Yahweh. And Jesus doesn't say ego emi autus, he says ego emi, I am, not I am he, I am. And then he follows this up with, and you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. After this, the high priest and the Sanhedrin rips their clothes and claims that Jesus is filled with blasphemy, that he has blasphemed God to, to accredit this kind of a title to himself. Clearly, Jesus is referring to Daniel and this was Jesus' favorite self-designation. He uses the expression son of man 84 times to refer to himself. So too, we see that when we compare the titles and abilities of Yahweh and Jesus, we see that these two line up like a hand and a glove. So we see, for example, Isaiah and Jesus are both called the creator of everything, the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the, the Good Shepherd, the self-existent I am, the savior, the redeemer, the rock. They're both called omnipresent, omnipotent, or all-powerful, unchanging, self-existent, eternal, able to forgive sin, able to answer prayer. How could anyone short of omniscience or being all-knowing answer 7.4 billion people's prayers? Now, when you compare these two, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, these line up and synchronize perfectly, that Jesus is claiming all of the prerogatives of God in the Old Testament. Well, if this is true, what about the direct claims? Well, there are many, I'll give you just a few. John 1.1 1, 1 states this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the word theos, God. Literally, he was God. We read in John 20, 28 that the skeptic Thomas, this is at the very end of the Gospel of John, 
so that you might believe. We read uh, Thomas saying this, my Lord and my God. Colossians 2.9, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Again, the, the theos, the God-man, uh, he exists as God and exists in bodily form. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It would not be an exaggeration to say that there are hundreds of passages or allusions to Jesus being God. Now, this leaves us with the difficulty. How could Jesus give us sound, ethical teaching when he himself made the most egotistical, narcissistic claims ever to be made on planet Earth? You know, it's one thing for somebody to say, well, that's a very uh, evil man, but he can teach you something about particle physics. Or he's a very evil man, but he can teach you something about history. But to say that he's a very evil man, but he can teach you something about ethics, seems to be just completely off the rocker. For Jesus to claim deity and to be wrong, he has not given us that option to interpret him. So moral teacher, myth, it doesn't seem so. What about a menace? What if Jesus was a deceiver trying to start some kind of a messianic kingdom? Well, the difficulty here is that deceivers buckle under pressure. Deceivers are out for themselves. They're trying to gain for themselves. And so when things go bad, they immediately buckle. They, uh, they give up their story. Uh, and yet, what do we see with Jesus? Right to the bitter end, in the face of all the authorities, in the face of torture and death, Jesus was calm, secure, uh, carrying himself with such grace, even to the cross, even at the cross, forgiving the people who were crucifying him. So too, deceivers don't defend victims. They victimize the defenseless. So we see Jesus throughout the Gospels, how he's constantly helping the, uh, the, the prostitutes, the adulteresses, the tax, collector, uh, tax collectors, the marginalized of society. And typically, deceivers are out for themselves trying to get something, and Jesus constantly worked with and loved the marginalized of society. He didn't go to them to take anything. He went to them only to give to them. And finally, deceivers need a sufficient motive. What would cause you to want to deceive so many different people? For many, it's money. Does this fit with Jesus? No, Jesus said in Luke 9, he said, foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So too, when Jesus had to pay the, the little drachma tax for the temple in Matthew chapter 17, he didn't have the money. He asked Peter to go find the tax for him. So he didn't have money. Was it power? Was he trying to get power for himself? Again, this doesn't fit with the data. The data show that Jesus actually was trying to avoid being a king. And in John chapter 6, verse 15, I love this. It says that the people were trying to force him to be a king. And yet Jesus removed himself from them. Before Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my, my disciples, my followers would pick up swords to defend me. What about sex? We see deceivers, particularly in the religious communities, they're always out for sex or money or power. There's one thing on which critics and Christians all agree, that Jesus was never married and that Jesus never had, there's no historical source that says that Jesus had sex or anything of the sort. Instead, he did have female disciples. He taught them, he accepted them, he loved them, but nothing where he was getting sex on the side. Well, the menace idea doesn't seem to work. What about the idea that Jesus was mentally ill? Maybe he wasn't a deceiver. Maybe he himself was deceived. Well, we need to remember not to minimize this claim that Jesus was claiming to be God. He made this claim in a first century Jewish context. Now today, when people say that they're God or they have a Christ consciousness as in new age beliefs or something of the sort, uh, or even reincarnation, which one in four Americans believe, that's not analogous whatsoever to a person, a Jewish person, let alone a Jewish rabbi in the first century 
claiming to be God, the infinite personal God, the cosmic creator. This was seen as, as the height of idolatry. This was seen to be completely narcissistic and egotistical. So no, we can't just brush this off as though he really wasn't making such an outrageous claim. Was he mentally ill? Well, it's interesting to point out that the New Testament itself includes this accusation from Jesus' enemies. What must it have been like? Well, it must have been that they were so confident in the character and the stability of Jesus that they knew that this just wouldn't stick. I mean, imagine if you had a, a, a five foot eight a model that was made of you know, nothing but Teflon and, and butter and banana peels. Uh, that still wouldn't be as slippery as Jesus is, which was a joke, by the way. Um, but anyhow, Jesus, nothing would stick to him when people made accusations that he was mentally ill, that he was uh, sick, that he was demon possessed. They knew that this just couldn't stick to Jesus. We also have to ask ourselves, how could the world be transformed by a delusional, narcissistic, egotistical maniac? In 2013, uh, Cambridge University Press published a book which was titled, Who's Bigger? where they ranked the different historical figures throughout history. And guess who came in right at the top of the list? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus has transformed the world in a way that, that we've never seen before. He's left an indelible, permanent mark on the world that no other person in human history ever has before. So too, the idea that so many people would be transformed by a man like this uh, that his moral teaching would come from a maniac or would come from a deceiver or someone who is deceived, the statement seems to answer itself. Finally, people who are psychotic megalomaniacs aren't difficult to identify. Let me give you one example. David Koresh was the cult leader of the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. This is what he wrote as some of his writing to be propaganda for his cult. He said, search forth for the meaning here. Hidden within these words, tis a song that's sung of fallen tears, given way of two love birds. She is mine, the hunter said. Twas this bird I raised and faithfully fed. Twas he bird who released her from her cage, sought her womb in youthful age. Love birds the name, these birds they call, two, plural, love bird takes two, Twas not her womb of which he sought, and certainly not her youth. And now we see the hunter man robbed without a prey. The evil which he sought to do caused the birds to pass away. And now we see the final meaning of this rhyme and verse. What were we supposed to take from that? Uh, the different lovebirds and one lovebird, two lovebirds, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. What, what did all that mean? What's the meaning of all that? the pending judgment of the king who rules the universe. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, but that completely went right over my head. You could see, and he goes on like this for 30 pages in his writing. Cult leaders, people who are psychotic, people who are trying to uh, uh, raise themselves into delusions of grandeur, these are not hard to find or hard to spot. The character of Jesus just simply doesn't comport with this kind of a character. So, as we close, who is Jesus? And why does it matter to you? Jesus is God, God incarnate, who lived among us. Just think of a star athlete, for example, who is physically fit, who is absolutely brilliant, who has multiple degrees and PhDs, and who willingly uh, went through physical violence for you so that he could be paralyzed from the neck down, so he could be blind and deaf and mute. Just get that picture in your mind. The gap between that man and the condition which he lowered to is nothing compared to the condescension that Jesus went to, being God, the infinite personal God, in lowering himself, giving up the utility or the use of his divine attributes 
while still containing them, not using them, to take on humanity. Just think about that. Think of the love that that would require, just, just that alone, for him to come and live among us, for love himself to enter our world. Many of us have that longing of the heart to be desired, to be loved, to be secure, and it's all true. Jesus of Nazareth is who he claimed to be. You are loved, you are accepted, you are secure, you're loved in him. He loves you to a degree that you can't conceive of. However much you think that God loves you, he loves you far, far more than that. And why did Jesus die? Just, just to take up the cross or just to come and live among us would be enough. But to die the worst of deaths at the cross, why did he do that? So that you wouldn't have to fear death. I've talked to many people who have said, well, I don't fear death. Really? To think that some point in the future, and you don't know when, it could happen at any time, all of your relationships will be ripped from you. If you live long enough, you'll bury your loved ones and your friends. If, if you don't, then they'll bury you. Every memory you've ever had will disappear. Every accomplishment that you ever made will crumble into the ashes of history. You don't fear death. Go to the cemetery and look at the tombstones. Not all of them show that the dates were uh, that of a person who died at the age of 90 or 80. Many are 16, 7, 25, 12, 30. Death is coming for each one of us. It is inescapable. It is in each and every one of ours, our futures. And we can't avoid it. And Jesus died so that you wouldn't have to fear death. He doesn't want you to walk around this world wondering where you're going to go after you die. He wants you to have security in, when, in what, where you spend eternity. He wants you to be secure in your eternal state, that you're going to be with him forever. For many people, they hear this, this language of Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. And to them, it's almost become white noise. Do you know what I mean by that? Where you hear something so much that it just kind of becomes white noise. You don't hear it at all. My wife and I used to live right next to the fire station. And next to the fire station, you would hear the sirens just tearing down the street. And for the first week or two, that really bothered us. And as the weeks turned into months, we didn't really hear it or even notice it until we had our friends and family over and all of a sudden they would just jump right out of their seat because it would be so uh, terrifying to hear those sirens raging down the street. And then when we had our first child, he certainly noticed those sirens. Do you hear this siren? That Jesus died for you? Has it be have you heard it so much that it's just become white noise or do you hear it as a piercing message of the heart, a piercing message of the soul? that's right for you, that's coming right for you, that God loves you with a fierce love, with an unthinkable love. Will you receive the gift that Jesus offers you right now? Why are you putting this off? Why are you procrastinating on making this decision? You know, if you can't remember a time when you personally received the gift of Jesus into your life, there's a good chance that you never did. It'd be like talking to a man who said that he was married and you say, well, when's your anniversary? And he says, I don't know. And you say, well, uh, how long have you been married? And he says, not sure. What's the name of your wife? Couldn't tell you. Well, what was the wedding like? <laughs> and so on and so forth. Eventually you'd start to wonder if this man was even married, if he couldn't remember a single thing about it. So too, as you listen here tonight, can you remember with 100% certainty the moment when you received Jesus into your heart. If you can't remember that, that's a chance that you never did. And you could fix all that here tonight. As we read in the beginning of the Gospel of John, he says, to all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What do we need to do? Very simple, not complicated. 
We just need to receive and we need to believe. If you open up your heart and say, Christ, I want you to come into my life. I want you to forgive my sins, all of my moral violations, my shame. I'm just gonna trust in you and I want to surrender to your love. If you receive and believe, then you will become. You will become a child of God at that moment. This is a prayer that Jesus will never refuse to answer. He will always answer this prayer. Jesus says, all who come to me, I will never put away. Let me pray for us as we close up. Heavenly Father, I wanna pray for those people right now who have that sense that they don't have you living in their hearts. They sense that emptiness, they sense that desire to be loved and secure, and they realize right now that they don't have it. I pray that in all humility, that they would just surrender to your love right here and now, come to meet you, come to know you, and experience the incredible joy that comes from knowing you and the love and forgiveness that you offer. I pray for anyone who did that here with us right now, and we pray that you would guard and protect these people as they continue to move forward in their relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it was good teaching you here tonight. If you're looking for more, we wanna give a gift to you. Uh, just look in the description of this video and we've got a free book that we will send to you. It's going to explore more of the evidence for why we would believe in Jesus. So we hope that you would take us up on that offer and get a good read in. I hope all of you stay well and God bless. We'll see you next time.